Register Guard article right here. Uh, since it came out and announced that in initial test results, uh, 21 trying related folks who've been tested have been found positive for both atrazine and 2,4-D in their urine. Since that article came out, a lot has happened. Uh, the governor took interest, and we have a very exciting, positive announcement that I really don't think anyone should be against. Uh, and, and that would be how I am tonight, so I can try to get you to stay here. But let's go ahead and go to the next slide. Let's go ahead and turn everything off that way we can see the screen better. Okay. That, I'm sure you can see you better. Would this work better if we turn the light yeah, out? Yeah. Like yeah. Do they have a hidden agenda? What's their motive? Etc. The person who did our study on our behalf is the most prestigious research scientist in the field of human and pesticide interaction. Her name is Dr. Dana Barr, and for nearly 20 years she ran the laboratories of the United States government, which are in Atlanta, Georgia. That's called CDC, Center for Disease Control. She ran our national laboratories for almost 20 years. And now, since the last two years, she's been working right next door to CDC, still in Atlanta, Georgia, at Emory University, which works really close to CDC. She was out here being the guest speaker, keynote speaker, this last winter at uh, the Corvallis in, Univer in the University of Corvallis. And since she was going to be a guest speaker, we went in there and told her about our situation here, and she decided she would have her laboratory pro bono. How many of you know pro bono means? For the good. Her laboratory, and I believe it cost her about $1,000 per person, <coughs> they've now tested, since that article came out, we've kept up the testing mostly on kids. And she's now tested uh, 34 people from the Triangle Lake region. We're also having her do some of the other forested areas uh, that aren't necessarily along Highway 36. 34 people she's done. It cost her laboratory about $1,000 per person. Uh, and so she's done this. Really, I would say because she's a mother. And because she's been in the field for so long and considered the greatest expert, she knows that families that are living along this highway, whether you believe it or not, are actually, you know, being affected. Every one of them. But it'll, it'll get some people you love and you care about. She knows that, and that's why she was willing at a tune uh, over $34,000 uh, of her own laboratory pocket to do this study for us for free. Let's go on to the next slide. One of those pesticides that she found in us is called astrazine. This element, two for me, they're about the two nastiest of all the pesticides. Um, that one, that one is found in the school water which I agree is in a tiny amount. That's the magiper, and that's not as nasty, nasty enough. But that's not as nasty as 2,4-D and atrazine. When we're talking about 2,4-D, we're talking about a pesticide that was, you know, a part of the Agent Orange formula in Vietnam. When we're talking about atrazine, you know, it's related to so many things that have to do with fetal death and birth defects that I believe that this is where we're not Republicans, we're not Democrats, and no matter what the are talking about, uh, we're a bunch of crazy people and thought they're against us. I just ask you tonight to open your mind to the possibility that we can still do everything we're doing here, all the lobbying you want to do, everything can happen, and just not have these things get in our urine. It's not very hard to have that be the result that comes out of the study. Now that the government's involved, because that's what he wants. 
But a brand new, you know, besides fetal death, birth defects, low birth weight, premature birth, how weird is it that atrazine turns male frogs into female frogs that can then only give birth to other male frogs? And now, out of the 34 of us that have been tested, the last dozen or so have even been kids, mostly from trying to get to it. Hey, 100% of us have been found to have the atrazine in us, and the 2,4-D. And yes, relatively small doses, but actually, Dana Barr, the pitcher I showed you, the greatest expert in the field, she was shocked. Here's why she was shocked. I told you she was a guest speaker at the University of Corvallis this winter. So what she decided to do was to jump right on it and have a bunch of us get tested right in when it wasn't crazy. She said that would be our baseline. And she expected to just show that we didn't have any in us during the winter. But it showed that 100% of us did have it. 100% of the first 21 people had it in us in the winter. And then she said that that growth goes with a growing body of evidence that shows that even though for years we've been told that the atrazine and 2,4-D just flush, if you get exposed, it's going to flush out for 24 to 48 hours. These studies that Dr. Barr is citing show that this came true. It's stored in your body fat. So, what she told us in the winter was, okay now, you've done your baseline levels. You've got right down to a little trillion. We know this is how much is in each of you 21 people. As soon as a spray happens this spring, within a mile or so of your house, go to Peace Health Lab on 11, the doctors there uh, were in charge of our urine the whole time. There's no way we could see that you had a chain of custody. Dr. Barr's an expert in knowing about chain of custody, so she made sure that was happening. Well, our second test showed a big spike in both 2,4-D and atrazine. When the aerial sprays happened, we had gone in, there was an aerial spray April 18th, and then another one April 19th between the lake and my house. And some of you live, like I do, you know, fairly close to where that all happened. And if you were drawing on a map with the Triangle Lake itself, the lake, as the epicenter, those of us that went back to the second test, as you progress out, the farther you go out from where the aerial spray People spike less. Everywhere we've been out to three miles, even though Dr. Barr said one mile, we went out three miles. Everyone spiked, which showed that the stuff moved at least three miles. And as the person lived a little bit closer to the epicenter where the spray occurred, they spiked more. Exactly. I mean, as things like this go, this is about the close to this slam dunk evidence that illegal chemical trespass occurred. Next slide. Since you received that video from since that newspaper article came out, I became aware of a study that was just published in February out of the state of Washington. <laughs> Researchers at the University of Washington in Seattle <laughs> We're wondering why the state of Washington has doubled the amount of one particular type of birth defect of any other state in the country. And that birth defect is gastro... I say this. Gastro... And what that is, is when a baby is born with its intestines and sometimes other organs also, outside of this body. And these researchers at the State University of Washington wanted to know why should our state have doubled? 
So we've got copies of the whole Big Ten study, but to give it to you in a nutshell, what they found is that they tested a number of different pesticides, not just atrophy, and they found out that specifically, this I'm saying atrophy is more nasty than your average pesticide. Everywhere that atrophy was sprayed heavily, within 15 miles of where it was sprayed, there's a huge spike in that exact birth effect. The study that Zero did on where heavy timber spray occurs in the state of Washington and found that it just skyrocketed off the chart, and that's where most of it from the state of Washington was actually coming from. So, this is why I say we're all in this together. I don't expect if you came here thinking you were against me or something like that, I don't blame you for still not jumping right on board with me. What I ask you to do is to be open to the possibility that your children, your grandchildren, all the people you care about are having this really bad thing called atrophy to get in them. And it isn't good. And that really we're on the same side. And really it turns out there's very easy solutions to the problem. And even though I might like to ban all pesticides or what we that is about to happen right now, what is about to happen is I think we can get them to quit using atrazine because right now the EPA, as we speak, is looking at making atrazine illegal. It would become an illegal pesticide just like DDP. And we can all hope so because the petition that we have on the table I waited an hour before coming here because I wanted something that we can all be in favor of instead of some of this in favor of some of those against. So what this petition is, I hope that any of you would support. But what it is, is we're asking the government, since he's taking an in interest in it, we're asking the governor <coughs> to simply have his health department do this same study that happened in the state of Washington. What's so beautiful is that it doesn't cost hardly any money. They just look at the statistics of their own health databanks and compare. Really cheap studies go. And let's find out, we're asking him in that petition, let's find out if the same thing's true in the state of Oregon, and if the same thing's true that in an area like the one highway 36 is spikes really high. I have to tell you that before reading the study, I already know two ladies along Highway 36 who had told me about that exact birth event happening to their babies. And so I think that they're going to find that the same thing is true in Washington is, is true here too. And I think that together, if we do stand united and don't let people make it bigger, if we can agree on this, regardless of what else we think about pesticides, I don't use them on my band. You know what I do with the uh, Scotch broom is I go out and I spend, it takes me one full day of eight hours a day to go out and cut it off at the base. And that's what I do, you know. But even if you're going to keep using pesticides and you're okay with brown and that kind of thing, let's work together to have the governor duplicate this study here. If it turns out we're on the chart for that birth effect, Let's ask the governor to make actions be illegal. You know? If it's in us and it's doing this to our babies, making their organs be born out of their body, we ain't Republicans and we ain't Democrats. We're people. Next chart. If you give people jobs to do it. Right. Yeah, and you know, when we're talking about hospital solutions, which is going to be uh, my topic tonight, the fact is, is, I don't know how many of you guys can know about this, but what just happened? This spring, did you notice those work crews along the highway that were removing uh, invasive plants? What invasive plant was that there? Yeah, the Napanese. And maybe you remember reading an article about it last year. Well, that was from us local people that care about these issues getting an organization that would come in and remove it just from manual labor and with donations from some of the people in this room. Um, we had the Napanee who moved along Highway 36 where they used to spray it for a while. We 
we had it removed just by a crew going out for a day. Can you imagine the employment for our young people if we were doing more of that kind of manual release instead of the poison? So just think about that. But anyways, dangers of 240, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, endocrine disruption. I used to just go right over that one because I've been studying this stuff for years now. I finally went to the trouble of looking up the word endocrine and studying it, and I realized, dang, that's an important word, though. <laughs> your endocrine system runs every organ in your body. And it turns out when we start reading about what's known about these pesticides, especially these two nastiest, 240 and atrophy in our area, they're known endocrine disruptors, which means any organ in your body that weirds out, it could be because of this 24D in your urine. But what's really bad is that all those safety tests, well, they're always based on one herbicide in your body. How much of a chance you have to get cancer? What happened is we could only afford to have Dr. Bard test for a couple of pesticides. Who knows what kind of stuff we have in us? And what is known by scientists is that it's the synergistic interaction between those pesticides that really makes a toxic group, a cancerous group. Let's go ahead and go to the next chart. 24D is in a class of pesticide called organophosphate. DDT is an example of organophosphate that was already made illegal. Folks, most organophosphates have already been made illegal. Because in the world of pesticides, this is one of those that you old timers that have been around here, if you ever heard that term, the old spray, well, after they make Agent Orange illegal out there, because after the Vietnam War it was being used as an herb, killer herbicide, but they didn't call it Agent Orange, they called it 245T. Well, the shocking thing is that this one organophosphate, 24D, is still legal and it's in our urine. And organic phosphate pesticides are linked with DNA damage, birth defects, reduce, reduce sperm count, clogged arteries, arterial sclerosis, coronary heart disease, cancers and tumors, whole body inflammation, peripheral nerve damage, neuropathy. Um, I can't read them all, so I'll just give you a couple of highlights. White. White matter lesions in the brain. Parkinson's disease. The man that lives right across the street from me, Jim Wilson. Does any of you have here tonight? Over here. Okay. Well, uh, these young folks, his, his kids, they can tell you that Jim right now is suffering from horrible Parkinson's disease. If you know where I live and you know where my driveway is, the driveway directly across the street is his house, and when you look at it, and see it's right underneath a giant hill, and that he's lived there over 30 years, so there's been a couple of spray cycles, and he's got this Parkinson's. Well, he's real sure, because in one of the amazing, one of the pages we included in our mailing view, you got to read about the evidence that links pesticides with Parkinson's. Again, it's these organophosphates, most of which are already illegal. Let's go to the next slide. Attention Deficit Disorder. The H in ADHD is about hyperactivity. So, again, in the mailing, so I'm just going to briefly touch on this tonight, we see that in a new study, and again, here's that word, organophosphates. Exposure of children to organophosphates in early life can cause brain injury. So this thing is in 100% of ours, I'm sure it's in all of yours, it's in all 34 people that have tested a lot of 136. This horrible chemical that's 
in us does that to his, you see. Next chart. Well, and it also gives us the attention deficit problem that contributes to it. There's the link between pesticides and Parkinson's strengthened with a new family study where after years of studies showing it was linked, they kept getting objections from the pesticide industry. Yeah, the study didn't count for this. They kept the study didn't count for that. So finally they did a study that would count for every complaint the pesticide in this industry had brought forth. And this was the result of that. It came out in 2008 where, yeah, it's very much linked. Most people who have Parkinson's is linked to pesticide exposure. Now, after category called organochloride, it turns out that organophosphates and organic organochloride are the two most dangerous class of pesticides known to man. They were made in the era where they were originally made for chemical warfare. Uh, 2,4-D was originally created by the United States military in the 1940s as a part of they then they had a highly funded nerve agent warfare. Remember, there used to be no law against making weapons for chemical warfare. That became a law in the 1970s. Those poisons that they were making for warfare in the 40s and 50s, 2,4-D is one of them. Okay, next chart. A lot of people, you tell them about how these things can even cause cancer and such, and that don't affect them. But I think most of us would care about cognitive decline. Now, if you don't know what cognitive decline means, then you really need to read this article. Direct exposure to pesticides could increase the risk of cognitive decline. That means our ability to think. According to a study published, blah, 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 the findings were based on test results gathered from 614 French farmers at the beginning and end of the six-year period. The research found that farmers who had been exposed to pesticides were most likely, in the majority of nine cognitive tests, to perform worse in the second test. This included being five times more likely to score a lower test score in the mini mental state exam, which is often used to assess cognitive decline associated with dementia. 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 <coughs> dementia. Learn something from the recommendation. It's not going to deal with dementia. Next chart. Some of them um, are critics. I've been emphasizing, see they used to tell us when we said we knew when we were inhaling this stuff after every was crazy, it was affecting us, we knew it was. But they used to say, well, you don't have to prove it. So then we come up with these scientists that find it in 100% of our urine, and you would think people would say, okay, we've got to prove it. But instead, the other side of the pesticide guys will never do that. They'll always try to kick at this some way. So what they're trying to pick on is they're telling people, yeah, okay, you all got these two dangerous poisons in you, and 240, but in small enough amounts that you don't need to worry about it. Actually, these nasty guys, 240 and there is no safe amount of these guys. But here's the point that they won't tell you. If anyone's advocating or picking on us out there, be aware of this. Nobody that knows a lot about pesticides like Dr. Barr who did the study thinks that any of you are going to have a close experience with a pesticide spray and then in another month or two have cancer or cognitive decline or anything like that. No, what, what we're suffering from out here is the reason that we know that when these studies are done they always find to be higher incidences and all the other things. Is long term, low level exposure to herbicides. Now that they found we have them in us in the winter, when they used to tell us, they swore to us, go up and pass for you in 24 48 hours. Well, now we know that that's not true, and not just with us, but in a bunch of other studies showing that wasn't true. Well, the problem is that means we always have this in us at a level more than the general population. So the people that live out here, we're 
It's long-term, low-level exposure to herbicides. Most people who get cancer from pesticides will never even know it was related to pesticides. It happens 20 years later. Fact. Like you said, most people who get cancer never notice that they were exposed to pesticides. Some of our worst critics on Highway 36 who will end up getting cancer will never believe they had to do with one of them in the Freedom of choice. Freedom of opinion. It's all okay. I'm just sharing information with you. Okay, next chart. Tricks about safety testing in laboratories. I'm going to speak with me tonight. We've got uh, several speakers. None of them is long-winded or having as much time as me, so don't worry. <laughs> Tricks about safety testing in laboratories. I definitely wanted to say a few things about this. When we first started out and we moved the pitchfork rebellion and complaining because we got sick and spray out of it, we didn't know anything about what really goes on. But we've been interfacing with it so directly now for seven years that we found out lots of stuff. One of them is that all that stuff about the safe level of St. Peter Massacre in the well water school, and Massacre was sprayed here in the winter. In the previous test of the school's well water that was taken almost two years ago, there was no massacre in the well water. Then the massacre was used here this winter, and now this spring there's a massacre in the well water. We're not saying it's a huge amount. That's not our point. Our point is, is that the massacre was the wrong pesticide to use for the job, and the spray applicator is guilty of that, because who can expect a school board member to know I always say one say what and then you say it's a bad word. Who can expect a school board member to know that all the warnings, all the labels, everything about the massacre for the last 30 years has said never use it near a well because the massacre has been scientifically proven, it's not disputed, to sink way deeper into the ground than any other herbicide. <laughs> The EPA refers to herbicides in a class called pesticides. So even though I use the word in herbicide, the EPA and all these government agencies include herbicides, fungicides, rodenticides, under the term pesticides. So that's why I'm using that term a lot tonight. So we found out that the EPA relies on safety testing on pesticides. All that stuff you hear about how much natural is safe in the water or how much super you have to take, which I'm telling you, are way nasty. The EPA relies on safety testing on pesticides done by the pesticide maker. Think back to the tobacco issue and what is now known about how the tobacco companies do it. Their scientists still today say there's no problems with the tobacco. You, know, you can never trust scientists who are paid for by the particular industry. So that's why we don't even believe that we want our kids to do any amount of master. And again, I'm not blaming the school board. I'm blaming that licensed applicator who applied an herbicide where there's a school well, even though every legal warning would tell them not to. That's who I'm mad at about that issue, not our school board. Fact. The safety testing is done on the active ingredient in any pesticide. There's a whole bunch of ingredients. The safety testing is done by the, in, the pesticide maker and is done only on the exact active ingredient in its pure form in the laboratory before they turn it into a pesticide. Dioxins, which are the really deadly cancer-causing thing in 2,4-D and all those organophosphate pesticides, dioxins don't become present in 2,4-D until you get to the manufacturing process. So everything that you ever will be reading from the EPA and government talking about how much 2,4-D you can have in it and such like that, they're not accounting for the dioxins that are part of the processing process. And that same point that I just made is true for all of this society. It's a total racket. You know, as far as um, my own political views, my dad was a staunch conservative Republican. And I disagree. 
agreed with him on some issues. But one thing my dad instilled in me, and it's one of the key things that has helped me be successful in life, is Republican economic savvy. Things like, you don't spend more than you're taking in. Things like that. Well, my dad, before he got visited me in Oregon one time. Mm -hmm. And he said that our thing that's in us is to get rid of a couple specific plants that you can easily get rid of without, even if you're going to use a pesticide, you don't want to use more dangerous. <coughs> but you don't even have to use a pesticide because there's easy ways to do it that would employ folks. So I just mentioned dioxins and other toxic contamination occurs after the safety testing is done by the industry itself. Nearly 100% of the testing labs in Oregon are members of a particular timber industry trade group. I found this out by accident. Some of you have probably seen that about once every three or four months I write a, a guest column, you know, a guest opinion for the Red Cigar. Well, after I wrote one, some guy who wrote another guest column back in mind. And at first I was kind of sad because he was from some environmental group. <coughs> it was called the National Council for Air and And he was a scientist. Well, thank goodness if you know I find it, let the kids teach me how to do it. <laughs> Some of us have been here before, you know, we haven't grown up with that stuff. So we Googled the National uh, you know, Association for Air and Stream Improvement, the National Council for Air and Stream Improvement, and we Googled that particular scientist that was attacking my guest problem. And it turned out that their, their organization owns 90% of the privately held timber in the United States. Their members are all. All the pesticide companies are a part of their organization. They were founded in the 1940s. And it turns out, when you do all the research, you finally find out that they're the ones that do almost all when I said the pesticide industry does the testing themselves, they hire these guys lab. In Oregon, virtually 100% of the test labs that could test the urine for pesticide are part of that organization. And here's how you get found not to have it. They already scientifically have figured out how much a person has to have in their urine in order to show positive. And so they set the standard lower than that. And when you're looking at the really complex chart of a urine analysis, before they show the column where the amount per trillion that's in your urine, before they show that number, there's this other number, and a couple of letters above that you know what you know they mean. That is the, where they calibrated the test to only find stuff above that number. And they conveniently set that number just a little bit above the number that they know that they would have to set it out on if they were going to really be finding any people. As far as the low level, long term damage to these pesticides that are happening to us. Fact industry related labs only test for levels related to acute exposure, not low chronic, and do not test as before it happens. If you're thinking about, we heard that after we announced our testing that we're doing, we heard through the rumor mill that a particular timber company is paying for some of their friends that belong to Highway 36 to get tested by a lab affiliated with that organization I told you about. And when, if you hear about that, or those results, ask them if that test they took tested for metabolites. Because the only way that they really find if you have a pesticide in you is if they test for metabolites, which are, if you have a particular pesticide in you, it does a particular thing, does a certain chemical reaction that creates a particular metabolite that no other chemical in the face of the earth has to stay So that's what doctors are testing. So if you get invited to do a test, ask them if they're testing for metabolites, and if they don't, walk the other direction. 
Glad I'm in the charge, so we'll learn. Look. Okay, I get it. is that if you knew how much of my own personal time has gone into seven years of hearing about this issue, you don't know how much of the core of my being I want to stop. I never wanted to do it, but just kept hearing it because we kept finding out new stuff that no one knew about, so we just kept doing it. But what I wanted to say at the end on is just that I don't want to be anybody living on Highway 36 in the enemy. I just want us to now have the governor do that same test that happened in Washington and find out if that's at the target. This woman, I end with her because, well, here's her story. A couple paragraphs of my enemies, right? Her name is Louise Connolly. And I'm dedicating tonight to her memory. Because she was one of the first ones out in this general area when she was from the Alsea town, Alsea Mother Town. Yeah. So the same kind of conditions we have, they have there, and they were having the same problems. She was one of the first people to really raise her voice about it. And <clears throat> I'm putting up with a single mother at age 22. Melise clung doggedly to the log house she and her ex-husband had built themselves. And I have to skip a couple of paragraphs at the time that describes how she worked her land and made her goat cheese and was really trying to be the farmer girl. <laughs> After the 245 tea ban, which one of our speakers is going to tell you about Agent Warren and how he used it out there. Um, after 245 tea, Agent Warren banned by the Forest Service out here, it announced it would substitute 24D. So this woman that I'm telling you about had one of those really close exposures in that the stuff was actually spraying, uh, you know, right into her property and the video, you can see the spray is just coming right out there. She, she and her child had that such a direct hit that, well, she was 22 when that happened, single mama, she was dead of cancer at 32, with all kinds of different cancers, but let me tell you. She's driving down the road and hears on the radio the county commissioner saying that all those folks complaining about being sick from our spray in Agent Orange behind the house, they're really all marijuana smokers, and that's the problem. So she heard him say that. And because she was so sick and her child was so sick and the animals on the land were so sick after the direct spray ripped on them, she went to see it. She drove 50 miles to the county offices in Newport, because that county kind of for her. Carrying her infant son in a bag of frozen dead poultry, after that spray happened on the land, all of her animals died, and she froze their bags into some government agents who might want to test them. She says, she puts the bag down on the commissioner's desk and she says, open it. As the startled commissioner peeled tinfoil from the small frozen bodies, Melissa placed her son, infant, on his desk and took off his diaper. Now, sir, she said, you told you tell me those ducklings died from smoking too much marijuana. And sir, you told me that my baby's bloody shits since the spray came and hit us. You tell me that that child's bloody shits day after day is from smoking too much marijuana. The next day, the commissioner went on the air and publicly apologized and actually became a champion and a friend of getting out of the spray. Buffer zone. That was a long time ago. We still haven't gotten out of the Buffer zone. You know, we've been saying, look, if you're going to keep spraying that stuff out here, Give us a buffer zone. Now we probably know we'd have to be at least a mile so the weather starts to drift and drift out. So if they wanted to keep us at all, you'd have to give us at least a mile. And then within that mile buffer zone, 
did. Ten years after Ryan Freed was prayed, ten years after Ryan Freed was prayed to two four D, Malise Connolly died at age thirty two of brain, lung, and breast cancer. The use of two four D in forestry continues to this day with EPA approval. When we really got into this fish work with William James, and we started going to government agencies thinking they would care, and we found that they didn't. We started researching the government agencies, and what we found out was that at that time, when we started up, the head of the EPA, Iron Mineral Protection Agency, for all of the Pacific Northwest, her office in Seattle, what's called Legion 10 of EPA, was Elin Miller, who was the CEO of Arista Life Sciences, which is a pesticide multinational corporation based in Japan. And previous to that, I've been on the board of directors or was an executive with Dow Chemicals. So that's who was in charge of the EPA when the Pittsburgh Rebellion started going to visit the EPA, a pesticide company executive for a multinational corporation. So Malise died of a true 4 exposure where the spray actually could be seen on the property. So that was an extreme case. Exposed to 22, dead at 32. Not all of us are going to have the extreme case, but tonight, uh, this meeting here, because she was really, along with the woman who wrote these words about her, Carol Benstrom, this woman and, and Carol who wrote the words about her dear friend are really the two voices that got things going on this issue, and that was 30 years ago, and still, except for getting aging orange, made illegal, we haven't had one victory in 30 years. Okay, who's next? Uh, I think my uh, Eric, <laughs> let, let me tell you why we have Eric show you some video footage, and after that, we have an aging orange expert, uh, <laughs> looking at the people who gave the masks of the office. The reason I'm having Eric show you this is because if we did live forestry for that, if we, instead of their chemical stand and things like that, then you wouldn't have the salmon population uh, dying out to the degree it does, and Eric's going to show you how that happens. Get a lot of pesticides in the stream water where the sand is already get to sadness and sand. But so does the sediment. I'll tell you what, we're being asked if we can all have a stand-up break. Let's do a five-minute break and then come back from there. So you have five minutes. I actually, since I'm seeing some, some numbers. Because a great synchronicity happened, and uh, this uh, place that I'm going to try 
drivers. Has anybody out here experienced any of the symptoms that I'm talking about? And any of your family experienced any of these symptoms? So I'm seeing that maybe about 25% uh, of the room raising hands. It's very slow growing. Um, if you have been to the doctor and you've been diagnosed with cancer or extreme allergies or um, chemical sensitivities or things like that, um, and your doctor doesn't say to you, well, where is your exposure? Don't be surprised. They never ever ask you. They always look for the cure. They never ever look for the relationship to what your exposure was. And that's because of many reasons. And I'll get into those in a minute. Um, most times, people don't know that they've been spraying. I think that was in Dave's uh, uh, slide earlier. And so therefore, they don't know why they're sick. There's no causal relationship to the symptoms of the disease, but it's there. And there, this happens because, number one, we're isolated. We live in a rural community. We don't know each other from valley to valley. I mean, the closest statement that Dave read from Harold on the about our friends and ladies, I knew we were back in uh, um, the early 80s. I was one of her uh, people that came over and hear her side when she was dying of breast cancer and then got in the brain. Uh, I put together a uh, anecdote, it's called an anecdote of epidemiology. Uh, all of you just in this area, fibers, dead wood, algae that I know that uh, have been affected with various symptoms or diseases. And I'll just break right now to have a sign-up sheet over here. I'm a videographer and audio video producer. If you'd like to have your story or the story of your family recorded, I would love to do that for you. Just sign that sheet and I will get in touch with you, okay? Um, but most doctors are diagnosed. I don't believe Dr. Richard is here tonight. I wish he were, because he's seen a lot of you folks for years and years and years, and he knows the history. And for some reason or another, that's not something he's willing to address. I wish he would. I believe he's one of our best um, resources, and I appreciate that about him. Um, prior to the 1970s, many of you all families know that when I was clear cut, the burn, and let the reports regenerate, and that's the reports you've done. Excuse me. And um, in 1973, they stopped, uh, the military stopped using Agent uh, Orange in Vietnam because of uh, toxic injury and dioxin poison. Now, TCGD dioxin, excuse me, really loud, excuse me. TCGD dioxin is a uh, manufactured byproduct, not just of 24D or 245T, but of both of them. Each of them, and those two chemicals together made by Dow Chemical are what constitute the Agent Orange. And about in uh, 1973, um, uh, a professor from OSU, a guy named Jim Norris, was appearing in the gateway between Dow Chemical and the Forest Service, I believe, the Science Law National Forest. I've heard it somewhere or another. Well, actually, one thing the Science Law was down in Tacoma, down in Southern Oregon, and they started testing spraying down uh, there. And a biologist, a uh, chemist, and a physicist from Tacoma went up and confronted Professor Norris and pretty soon they stopped. So then a few years later, around 76, another professor from OSU, a guy named Mike Newton, who basically I refer to as mental abuse, which I'm uh, experimenting on people without even uh, knowing it. That's a harsh statement, but you've got to think about that. And Mike Newton collaborated with the Sunnyside National Forest, and they started using Asian Orange to change the forestry model. The forestry model went from a normal block, it might have been clear cut, burn, let it regenerate, to clear cut, burn, helicopter spray, replant, and then happy story. And many, 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 many people, even to this day, working for private timber operations or regeneration companies are caught up in that cycle. The back in the day, back in the 70s, was the Sunday Swamp Workers Go Home. And it was the hot and it was all over. It goes all the way from Northern California, all the way up into the Olympic Mountain Range. It goes all the way through the Milan, all the way up. And I have friends, I have a friend who was videotaped for PBS, who 
explained to me that she literally gave birth while being in the Hodak camp, um, up in the Willamette National Forest, to what she calls Kobukasa. And she was about five months pregnant. And um, the birth defects directly from the age of orange were things like what Dave said, but also some palettes. I have a young niece, kind of, from Deadwood, who grew up there, she was born with a palette, very little year, and she grew up in early age. Total mentions my culture, that means excellent people, and got the surgery together for her to have that repaired, and now she's pregnant with a baby. I just had her baby shot yesterday, and I was like, prayers for that child every single day. And so, that's the forestry model that exists today. In about 1983, people from uh, Five Rivers and uh, Deadwood have been working for a number of years through an organization they call CAC, Citizens Against Toxic Spread, one of them is right here in Bill Serena. And he and Carol Armstrong and other, uh, C. Pedro, a biologist, PhD, and uh, another man who was a PhD, they did the research and they got up from the evidence to then Congressman Jim Weaver about what was happening in Alice Alcee, Five Rivers, and Deadwood, and how much miscarriages were happening up in Alcee in particular, but all kinds of other health issues that happened in the Deadwood area. I have anecdotal epidemiology. I want to hear your stories. We put that into it and present it to the EPA and present it to the governor and present it to whoever will listen to the warehouser. For instance, and um, in 1983, at the congressional hearing, Professor Mike Newton from OSU literally poured to Agent Orange, 245T and 24D on his wife's leg and she thought how harmless it was. And of course, it's not happy because you don't get the acute reaction to it that way. It's not instant, it's lifelong. And the reason it's lifelong, well, let me finish one second. So, the outcome of that congressional hearing was that 245T was deregistered, which effectively means it couldn't be manufactured anymore. So they just took it over to New Zealand and started manufacturing it over there. I have a video I can never even show you that. Not here, they did not provide it to anyone who wants. And the way TCTD dioxin works, and that's why it affects the fish, is it, it attaches to sediment. The molecule attaches to sediment. And then with all the rain we have out here, it moves through into the trees. And a professor that I've interviewed um, with NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, um, when I asked, how do you test for TCPD dioxide? It's not a pesticide. We don't test for it. It's considered a POP, which means persistent organic pollutant in the environment. So they don't test for it. Now, why don't they test for it? Here's what TCPD dioxide does to us. It affects the mitochondria. Big word again. It's the end of the type of our cell. So it's going to be passed genetically, it can affect any organ in our body, any system in our body, and it uh, mutates them. So if they don't test for TCD dioxin, why not? What do you think? Is it liability, property liability? Is it, uh, people, uh, is it uh, liability for the government, what they're going to do to try to? Clean this mess up and get created and allow it to happen. Do you guys like really want this known? Because it does affect our property values, it's a concern for us. We want it known because it's shameful and humiliating to have disease. Because we want to be healthy, perfect, like human beings, specimens. It's very hard for people to accept that this is happening and they won't test for it. I think that's one of the things we need to ask them to do. So that's pretty much what I have to say. This is what we can do. We should be demanding from our government, from our state, a full, not anecdotal epidemiology, such as I've collected, but a full epidemiological study of anyone who's willing to participate. We need to explore and research if the government's fear of liability is at the heart of why they will not test for TCDD dioxide. It's a pristine environment. Another test was done in the Red River Valley in North Dakota. Because all these people were getting pure agricultural environment. 
no uh, uh, manufacturing oil whatsoever. Yet, in that environment in, in North Dakota, people had a really high incidence of neuromuscular uh, disease and Parkinson's and such. And what they discovered is that if the pesticide attaching itself to the pollen and getting right into people's mucous membranes, they're filling the resistance. So, there's another man here who's worked in New Zealand on citizen inquiry for toxic substances and toxic, toxic injuries. His name's Don Kurtz, who's a member of the OTA board. And I think we should be doing citizen inquiries and town hall meetings like this all over the communities that have been affected. Uh, 600 people signed a petition in, in Walford about four years ago and got nowhere with it with our state agency called PARC, which is supposed to be investigating uh, pesticide issues. Um, we need acknowledgement that this is real. We have it, it's real now. Day and others, um, bless their souls, have taken it upon themselves to do the hard gritty work of making sure that we know this is real. We need an acknowledgement. A year ago, the Aspen Institute in Washington, D.C., run by a man named Michael Walter Eisenstein, negotiated a settlement, so to speak, between the government of Vietnam and the United States government. And it was an acknowledgement of dioxin poisoning and toxic injury in Vietnam. Now we have the proof of it here. Carol von Strong did her extensive library and others like uh, Gary and Jay and myself, we were scanning just reams of documents in to show that yes indeed they use Agent Orange here. So if they are acknowledging um, toxic injury and dioxin contamination in Vietnam, they must acknowledge it here. We just simply need to show them the documentation that they spread. That's it. It's got to be real. That's one thing we need is acknowledgement. Another thing we need is those of us that are sick, or whose families are sick, and we're children, or children are sick. We need to address the issues of compensation. It's not a matter of how much. It's a matter of acknowledging that we have expenses and loss of income due to our health uh, issues. <coughs> but lastly, and maybe most important, we need remediation of the mountains, of the creeks, of the streams that go all the way out of the ocean that's affecting our sanity. And it's going to affect our community for generations to come. So please sign the, um, up to get your story reported. I really would love to hear from you. Um, you can find me in, uh, online at informproductions.com. I'm happy to talk to anybody. I'm happy to answer any questions. But I'm happy when I can make time to come to you. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you.
Because that, to me, is the greatest wealth that we all can have, is our health. And that's where we can create anything in our life when we actually have our health. We can have inspiration, we can be creative, we can uh, help others, we can help ourselves when we have energy, when we are not achy and in pain, when we don't have headaches and all of these issues that basically uh, we are facing in today's world that we have and now we're pretty much uh, getting very close to uh, the reasons why we're having these issues as humanity, as people, as community. And because we always start from uh, ourselves and uh, we look at our choices in life and we see what is that we can do to do better because I believe that we can all do better. I keep doing better and better all the time. I just want to be better. I uh, have a garden and I choose not to use pesticides in my garden because I know that they hurt, they will hurt my air, they will hurt, they will hurt the water, they will hurt the soil, and they will hurt me because I don't think, uh, you know the song of Earth My Body, Air My Breath, uh, water my blood. Did you ever hear that song? Well, that's very really true because we actually are what we eat, we are what we breathe, and we are also what we think as well. So we are very powerful, and this is where inspiration comes from, is that we take up our blinders <laughs> and we speak about the truth, and we come together like the song was uh, singing uh, as we were in the circle, we come together as a group and say, we are going to make changes for better and be better and better. So basically, I'm here to talk about solutions, but I also want to touch up on something that is really interesting that I haven't heard, is that uh, some, a little bit of a facts here, what we know. Private timber owners create herbicides on nearly 800,000 acres of Oregon forests in 2006. Now, this is happening every year, and we have hundreds of thousands of pounds of uh, pesticides being put in our, on our land, and it's, it's just circling in the air. And as Dave was pointing out, it is circling the fog, the earth, uh, basically <coughs> And basically, Earth also sweats, and, and there's fog. And as we remember the song, Earth, My Body, so the Earth sweats and evaporizes what? As we have learned, toxins. So basically, uh, there is toxins in the air when the, that's what we call our environment, our air, our water, our soil. So uh, we're all our environment. We breathe the air, we drink the water, and we, we garden the soil and harvest our fruit, fruit from our soil. So the solutions to the problems are that we need to think of the ways how to fill the channels of poisoning of our air, which is our primal food. So when I got tested, and I uh, in winter also had 2,4-D and as everyone else, and batteries in, in my body, 24 hours after the spray uh, that happened right behind the hill of the Triangle Lake, I actually went in and I took another test. And my levels of atrazine and 24 d were higher. What does that tell us? Is that that is in the air, it's traveling. We get air from China, we get air from Japan, and everyone's like worried about radiation. We get air from all over our state and from all over the world. So basically, we are, the air is circulating. So um, different companies uh, like to tell us, you know, that these, these materials stay good and, you know, never, never uh, admit the truth. And it's, it's, you know, we're all intelligent people. We know that uh, this, this is not true and why they do that. So the solution is we need to close the channels of of these chemicals being put into our air. That's our primal food. That's the first solution. So I ask all of us to reconsider and say, well, I have a garden, I have maybe a farm, or maybe I'm producing uh, uh, trees, maybe I'm producing Christmas trees, maybe I'm producing whatever. But basically, I need to reevaluate 
all weeds as human beings because weeds are only plants that we do not want them. And so basically, we go over there and we manually take the brush down. It's more work, but it's worth it. It's worth it for your health, for our health, for health of our air, because again, this stuff travels. It's, 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 there could be a neighbor out there that, you know, again, pesticides will not know the difference between your property line. And it's a poison. Let's face it. It's a poison that, and no matter how much agencies want to, uh, want to put in our mind and, and that, you know, this is fine and more levels, and we know better. Because when I moved here in 2006, I had multiple exposures where I actually uh, came, I teach people how to get healthy. I'm an educator in health, I'm an herbalist, and basically uh, I help people to get healthy. But when I came here in 2006, I noticed huge change in my own health. I noticed that things that never bothered me, pollen. Then I started to have some hay fever reactions. And, you know, my nose would run, I would get headaches, I started aching in my joints. I never had this before. Now, again, I am a very healthy person, and I am my own doctor. So I know how my body feels the best. So I have noticed changes in my husband, and I wanted the truth. And this is what this is about. This is about truth. We no longer can be true. And I always like to say, lies have short legs. So we better know that the truth will always come out in whatever in whatever in our lives. So uh, to go back to the solution of the of our own inner choice of our own choices is when we have our property, we can choose to do things differently for ourselves, for the air, and knowing that our, maybe our neighbors are not interested, of course, and you know, to nobody wants to get uh, to breathe in poison air. So uh, informing our neighbors is one thing. We can't make choices for others, you know. We would love for everyone to, to understand these facts and these truths. And, uh, but we all have freedom of choice. And, but we all have heart. We all have uh, uh, loved ones. And we all care. We're all uh, human beings. So that's where uh, we need to come from the heart. And open up our heart to other beings. Say, you know, I do not want to hurt anyone, nor myself, you know. And so basically, uh, that's the uh, closing off the channels of the air pollution is really important. And uh, the timber companies, basically, what they would, would really create a lot more jobs in our area would be if we would resolve the thinning project. If we actually used... Uh, use uh, local people, hire local people, and actually remove brush uh, manually. There's so many people that need jobs. There's so many people that are unemployed. And so we need, we need to uh, think in this direction. And uh, I built my house solely from, uh, uh, from the actual FSD wood, which is Forest Stewardship Council, which is thinning project wood. I did not want to support the clear fence. I was able to afford it. And so why not put my money into that cause rather than into the cause of clear cutting and uh, pesticide? You know, you can do things differently and still have logging. Like I said, we all need income. We love people and loggers. And there's many people in the community that think we're some kind of environmentalist, uh, anti-logger. And I think our point was really clear in that, that we we're all people and we're all things together. So basically, let's go into the direction of thinning rather than clear cutting. So that will create more jobs. Yes, it will actually uh, be more cost for for the timber industry. But guess what? There's hidden costs of our health, of our joy, of our birthright to really, uh, you know, be uh, at our prime and live life like we should live in good quality and really uh, not go through all kinds of emotional stress and, and depression. Depression is actually caused by pesticides and toxins in the body. I don't know if you know who knew that, but all of these different uh, emotional and body elements are all caused of toxic overload. So if we can take that, if you imagine a cup, and 
then there's like cup being filled with all kinds of different toxins. And basically, our, uh, this spoke here, which we're giving out for free, and by the way, everything on that table is for free. Uh, we put in <coughs> our uh, uh, time and effort and finances to help bring God to the truth. So we are basically uh, asking you to like to pick up this book. This is a wonderful book, actually, from a, uh, a medical doctor. And here's what it's talking about. I got it.
Uh, subscribing to ODF, knowing what happens in your area is a wonderful solution. Knowing what is happening in your area is being aware. And that's number one. Second, it's really important to get involved and see how to uh, 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 detoxify your body. Basically, that's one of the things that I'm doing right now. I am on a super detox plan. And because I know all the herbs and all the natural products, because you're not going to do uh, drugs for a detox, because that's a chemical again, and it's a, it's a synthetic, and it's can actually uh, uh, damage your liver and kidney, which is already damaged, as the whole system is damaged, as we uh, already spoke about, an endocrine system being damaged by these chemicals. So there are many, many different ways to detox. And this is very sensitive, uh, sensitive thing because we're all different. All of our metabolism, metabolisms are different. So we will have different reactions. Uh, uh, one will have rash, one will have headaches, and all kinds of different ways of reacting to, the, to these sprays. But the most important fact is that we need to detox our bodies if we're to be healthy. If we want to be healthy at this time, while we're working at the same time, then while we're working our regular jobs and all other things. Because I always tell people, you know, nobody's paying Gabe, nor I, nor Mila, nor anyone here that comes and works on this, and we've been working with this for day, it has been for seven years, for us it has been for five. And uh, nobody pays, pays us to do this. We need to, we actually need to do it. Because there's not any other way know that you know we have jobs, we have our busy lives, but we also need our help. We need our help back. And we need our help as a community. We also need to we need to start uh, working together more and, and, and trusting each other because there's so much mistrust in this community. When I moved here I'm hearing a lot of gossip and a lot of uh, you know a lot of just mistrust in regards to all the rebellion people and this and that. I think that all needs to cease and stop. I think that, like I said, we just need to really, really look within ourselves and face our inner selves and say, what is the truth here? You know, am I really going to be... So basically, I'm just going to uh, show you some things that are really amazing that you can do uh, to detox your body. I have to tell you the truth. I can't, I can't be lying to you. I have to tell you. 
tell you uh, where we got to start first if we want the help is to detox our body. And another thing is the key to health is mineralization of your body. Since the actual production of chemical fertilizers and chemical uh, pollutants and poisons, I call them poisons, I don't even call them anymore pesticides. Since the since production of that, all of our soils have been demineralized because what does the pesticide do in the soil? What does the poison do in the soil? It kills microorganisms that are actually one of the catalysts for creating and taking up certain nutrients from the plants. So our whole nation right now, actually, but we're focusing up here, is actually demineralized because of these chemicals poisons. So if we want to get healthy, we got to get in the detox. And we got to stop the channels of, of what's happening in our environment and get, get active. But to get active, you have to have some energy, right? We can't get active and do what we do all the time while we're working on our farms and while we're doing all the other things. You have to get some energy back so that we can actually have you and have us all together be part of this and work together. So, anyways, uh, David, it's going to be, there's so many things. We've got two more speakers in it. Oh, so late. This is probably. Awesome. Well, I didn't get to the part, but I'm going to in a second. Yeah. I didn't even get to the part of information that I have as far as, like, detox goes, because this is a whole, I mean, I can do a, a whole workshop for this. But I'm going to get you a whole, I'm going to get you introduced to another book. It's called Invasive Plant Medicine. And this is another ploy of the chemical companies that are trying to uh, get us brainwashed that we have uh, these invasive plants that now we gotta get this, what's the solution for them? More poison, poison in these invasive plants so that we can get them out of here. They're going to, they're going to eat us up or something. So basically, uh, please get this book, Invasive Plant Medicine. This book is actually written by an amazing uh, man and this is your good uh, uh, guide, what's in your backyard as your medicine. Things that you may be trying to sp spray for is actually maybe your actually best ally for your health. Scotch room, uh, then a Japanese nap, nap weed, uh, not weed, then Japanese not weed, nap weed, all of these plants, English ivy, all these plants are actually your medicine. So I encourage you to look at this book and again be your own doctor. Do as much research as you can and please, please, please again as much as you can uh, uh, support in whatever way you can uh, this movement and, and stay healthy. And uh, peace to you all.
Seattle, I live in Yaha, uh, but all my courses are online, so I can live where I want. I teach courses in biomedical ethics and environmental human rights and introduction to philosophy. I've written a book on a human rights approach to environmental issues. I'm the founder and director of an organization called Environment and Human Rights Advisory. And I'm just a small part of a movement that is well underway now, uh, that approaches environmental issues like this from a human rights perspective. There are now, when I first wrote that book about 10 years ago, there was one environmental organization that took a human rights approach. Now there are probably six or seven in the world. Uh, seven or eight years ago, when I was just starting this stuff, I googled two terms, environment and human rights, and got four hits. About two years later, I thought I'll try that again, I googled the same two terms and got over a hundred hits. If you google that term today, you'll get thousands of hits. There are now, in the last five years, there have been five or six big books written about human rights and the environment with titles like Human Rights and the Environment. There have been uh, conferences, now two conferences at the University of Oregon Law School just in the last uh, three years. Two years ago, a conference on the environment and human rights at the University of Washington Law School. There's now a journal called the Journal of Human Rights and the Environment. There's a global network of, for the study of human rights and the environment that I'm part of. The first international conference on human rights and the environment is being held in Spain uh, in the year, June 2012. Uh, I'll be going to say to present a paper there. And uh, so I thought a couple of the ideas that I'm going to present in that paper might get presented here. So there's um, this, this is coming down the pipe that a human rights approach to environmental issues is something that's not here yet, but it's coming. And so my job for the next six or seven or eight minutes is to give you a little idea of what it is and how it works. So first of all, um, how many of you can think of some way in which your life now is better as a result of what people who lived before you <coughs> did. How many of you can think of a situation, some, some way in which your life is better as a result of what your forebears, who are no longer alive, the work they did, the sacrifices they made. How many of you can think of something? How about just one or two examples? Electricity. Mm -hmm. Electricity, okay. Mm -hmm. Not running water, okay. The physical. National parks, wilderness areas. National parks, beautiful. Polio vaccine. Polio vaccine. Polio vaccine. So these are medical, these are things that, and physical things that are better. How about the quality of your life? Any other way? First Amendment. Pardon? First Amendment. Namely? Uh, free speech. Free speech. Free speech. People struggle for that, fought for that. Okay. Um, people can vote. Some people can vote now. They couldn't vote before. And the struggle to acquire that uh, right to vote was uh, a lot of work, a lot of suffering, a lot of sacrifice to do that. Well, you folks who are working on this issue are doing it partly for yourselves, because you want your own health to be better. You're doing it partly, I'm guessing, largely for your children and grandchildren and offspring. But you're also doing it whether knowingly or not, for people who aren't even thought of yet, for future people who are going to benefit from the sacrifices you're making now, the work you are doing now, the energy, time, and effort you're putting into this, and the suffering that you're going through right now. So, um, what are human rights standards? Let's say I passed out some things there, and I, I, I'd like to hear you read out loud the uh, 
one that you've got there in your hand. There's probably 10 or 12 of them, 10 or 12 different ones. Somebody will? Go ahead. Every person has the right to live in an environment adequate to his or her health and well-being, and the duty, both individually and in association with others, to protect and improve the environment for the benefit of present and future generations. Yeah. Okay. I like that strong voice. <laughs> Another one. No one shall be arbitrarily deprived of his property. Anybody been deprived of their property because of uh, pesticide spray? Yeah. How many? Deprived of the use of their property? Have they abandoned their property? Maybe? Okay. One more. States parties to the present covenant recognize the right of everyone to the enjoyment of the highest attainment <coughs> standard of physical and mental health, and that's from the Convention on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. The right to the highest standard of physical health. One more. Women and children. Who's got women and children? States parties recognize the right of the child to the enjoyment of the highest attainable standard of health. Yes. <coughs> and women and children. Somebody shut down. It says women and children have the right to special protection. Uh, so what these are, these, what, what are human rights standards? Every one of these that you just read there is applicable to a situation like this. Pesticide, basically pesticide trespass onto your body, into your body. The kind of, uh, the, the worst kind of chemical trespass. It's not just going onto your property. It's going <coughs> into, into your bodily tissues. So what are human rights standards? They are, uh, human rights norms, is what, here's a definition, a justified moral claim that every citizen has vis-a-vis -vis their government. And it's if their moral duties that every government has toward every single one of its citizens. If one person human rights have been violated, then human rights violations have occurred. Human rights standards apply to individuals. They don't apply to groups or to majorities or to communities. They apply to individual persons. So, uh, human rights standards are justified moral claims that each one of us has vis-a-vis -vis our government. Are they legal claims or moral claims? You can think about human rights standards in legal terms. You can think about human rights standards, as I agree with Ross Professor, in moral terms. They are, first of all, moral demands. Hopefully, at some point, they get instantiated into laws so that we can turn to laws to compel governments to respect those uh, rights. Okay, uh, a little bit of language here. Um, do you have the right to clean air? I'm going to say yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Does, is your right to clean air being respected? No. 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 <laughs> Are you, so, so there's, a, there's a difference. You can have a right. Now let's take another example. Your right to vote. Do you have the right to vote? Yes. yes. Is your right to vote being respected? Yes. Yes. So you're enjoying the right to vote. Those are the three main terms in, in this kind of discourse. So when it comes to, here's another example. Um, do children in schools have a right to not be poisoned while they're in school? <laughs> yeah. um, you'd say yes. Yes. Yeah. Is that right being respected? No. no. Uh, so are they enjoying it? children enjoying no. that right? No. But, interesting thing, just in the last, uh, about two years ago, the Oregon State Legislature finally passed a, a law that's going to require 
that's going to prohibit schools from applying pesticides, herbicides, or insecticides, or any kind of pesticides in schools, uh, with very few exceptions. So no herbicides or pesticides can be applied for preventive reasons, no, none can be applied for cosmetic reasons, and none can be applied routinely on a schedule. Thing. There has to be some specific ex uh, need. So there's an example of a law that we didn't, that we have, children have, and it's about to be, it goes into effect July 2012, uh, it's about to be respected and children are about ready to be able to uh, enjoy that right. Uh, okay, so uh, we would like, we prefer to have these things instantiated in law because laws can compel behavior. That's what we like about laws. Uh, as opposed to moral standards, which at first glance we think maybe laws can compel, moral standards can't compel. <coughs> but, not so simple. Moral standards can compel behavior too. They just do it in a different way. And that's what Gandhi was all about. Gandhi, moral standards can compel behavior with a different kind of force than law uses. Gandhi called it truth force or moral force. The, the Hindu word for that, Hindi word for that is satyagraha. And uh, so um, his way of nonviolent resistance, um, the uh, people, the victims of abuses of standing up and being more dignified than their perpetrators, being more honorable, acting less violent than their perpetrators, all those are important standards and ways to compel and eventually get to uh, changes. So, what do you hope out of all of the sector? What do you hope from uh, human rights standards, moral standards? Uh, human rights, three things. Uh, human rights standards can uh, inspire to change and lead to change can be guidelines to change. Ideally, we want, for example, the right of women and children to special protection, the right of everyone to this highest standard of health. We want those to, we want the world to change so that those are respected and that we can enjoy those rights. But that's going to be a long road. Before, you know, it's not going to happen in the next few weeks might not happen in the last, in the next couple of years. It may happen in over a period of time. But the battle you're doing now, the struggle you're in right now, is a step in that direction. So if human rights standards, even when they don't affect immediate change, there's some other things, two other things that they can do. They can be used to uh, hold people accountable. That's a very big deal. Um, these, let me just back up for a second. These human rights standards that you have written there are written down and articulated in internationally accepted human rights conventions and treaties that governments sign. The U.S. has signed most of these. And when a government signs a treaty or a convention like that, they commit themselves to being held accountable. So when you, you uh, each one of these pieces of paper has that, that right and the treaty in which it's instantiated, articulated. So one of them, if, if a human rights standard isn't changing the world, at least it can secondly hold people accountable. <coughs> See, here's a standard. The United States, when the United States government signs these treaties, they they commit themselves at every level of government, right down to the mayor, right down to the county commissioners. They commit themselves at every level of government to being held accountable to those standards. So when you have a human rights document, you can hold someone accountable to it. And the third thing, even if that doesn't work very right, well, if change doesn't happen, it's hard to hold people accountable, at least the third and one of the most powerful is the sufferers can bear witness, can bear witness to injuries, harms, 
that are done to them that violate those standards. The way you can bear witness, one of the best ways to bear witness is to write your story, to tell your story, record an account of how you have personally been impacted. In uh, uh, a lot of the human rights stuff started after World War II, you know, with all the uh, horrors of the Third Reich and then uh, came to light. And the way they came to light was by seeing personal stories, film, documentaries of terrible stuff that happened. So one of the things I would ask of you to do, as you can saw already asked of you a few times today, is to record your uh, personal story, either on video or being offers to do, or in written form. Because uh, personal memory is like that, a first step in getting human standards uh, recognized and respected. So uh, I'm done, but I just want to leave you with the, the reminder that the, the work that you're doing here, the effort to change things so that people don't get poisoned, that's a generational effort. That's something you're doing for yourself and for your children and for people wanting to talk. <laughs> Professor Tom Kerr, a smart man. We end with a 10 minute slot given to my wife. I can give you the announcement of what the governor's office called and told us. That I've been putting you off on. I'll let that only take one minute at the end of her visit. <laughs> governor's announcement to us. Thanks, you guys, for, for being here. And I'm going to do as Tom Kurds uh, suggested. I'm going to tell my story about how I've gotten poisoned in the last few years since I've been living here. And um, I also encourage you to tell your story, too, because it is important. So thanks for that tip, Tom. Um, when I moved out here seven years ago, I didn't realize the issues of this uh, aerial spraying that was going on here. I was informed about it from some of our neighbors and good friends. And um, I had a lot of compassion for <coughs> the stories that they had told us of them being sickened and um, people being rushed off to the hospital, people with cancers, testicular cancer, all kinds of uh, birth defects and all this kind of stuff. And so we, we took it to heart. We believed what our friends were telling us. When we, knew, when we heard the truth, we knew it was the truth. And I'm here today on a mission. My mission is a piece of truth and of health. And um, yes, when I moved here seven years ago, I uh, was a healthy uh, mother of five and now a mother of six because I've adopted a local girl um, that uh, lost her mother recently from this neighborhood. Um, her mother passed away um, less than a year ago. So I'm a, a proud mother of six beautiful children. And when I moved here, um, I had great health. All of my kids are born at home. All the children breastfed, all of them grown up on organic food, a pure water, and um, just plain organic love is what, what we're all about. Well, when we had our first exposure to chemicals of herbicides uh, exposure, helicopter uh, exposure, that was on October uh, 12, 2007. Roseburg Timber was doing a spray just a half a mile uh, west of us. They, did, they started that spray real early in the morning that day. And I am an outdoors person. Um, I'm a farmer, gardener. I raise um, animals, uh, dairy goats, sheep, horses, uh, poultry, uh, an organic garden and orchard. And all of these types of things entails being outdoors a lot, which I love. I love the outdoors, love nature. When I moved here, I was told by the faculty of this school that I had just moved into God's country. And I believe it. I actually believe every part of the, the earth to be God's country. And I love the earth. I love the air. I love the water. I love the things about nature. And when I moved here, I was very happy to be here in this beautiful area. As I said, that day when they were spraying, 
About an hour into the spray, I had about a four or five hour exposure that day. They were spraying for hours. Uh, Roseburg Timber was spraying that day. And you could hear it, and you could see it, and you could smell it, and you could even, um, within, like I said, within an hour of the exposure, I was getting sick. I was getting um, heart palpitation. Um, I was getting a weakness, muscle weakness. It uh, went into, um, then in deep into my joints, deep into my organs, into my uh, spinal cord. These chemicals are very dangerous. This is nerve toxin, nerve poison. You might look at somebody and go, oh, they look perfectly fine to me. But inside, it attacks your body, it attacks your nervous system, it attacks your organs. For months after that exposure, I was so, so sick. My menstrual cycle started five days early after my exposure. It was, if I had been pregnant, I would have had a miscarriage, I can assure you of that. I was so, so sick. It was horrible. The symptoms lasted for months. I had pain, as I said, in my joints and uh, just all throughout my body. I felt like an arthritic old person that, and I had never felt these things before. It took months. Now, I've had several exposures since then. Also, my children, too. My daughter uh, took an exposure um, in May of 2008 where she had to go to the doctor and she was experiencing headaches, a spinal pain, and pain in her organs, in her kidneys. Just this spring, on, on April 19th, there was a spray going on on Fish Creek Road. It was being done by warehouses. And I was outside that day, as usual. It was a beautiful day. And I love to be outside on beautiful days. And they happened to spray on the first sunny days of the year. So I was out there. I was training our horse. And I was doing about, oh, a two and a half hour training session with a horse that was just um, recently learning to, to saddle. He was just recently saddled. And actually, it was the first day I'd ever gotten on it. And so I spent two and a half hours riding him while they were spraying. Within about an hour or two, I noticed I was starting to get a headache. And the headache, <coughs> excuse me, this kind of a headache that you get from these chemicals, it is very debilitating. It, it pretty much just wipes you out. Um, and they can last for days, these headaches. Well, I went ahead and I went to a meeting that night. Um, I'm doing honeybees. And um, on our land, because we don't use chemicals, our honeybees are very happy and we've got a bounty of honey, actually. Our land is flowing with milk and honey. <laughs> and part of the reason is, is because we're not using chemicals. The bees don't do well with chemicals. Um, I went to a meeting that night in, in Eugene on the 19th, uh, a honeybee meeting. I sat through that meeting with a headache, feeling sick all that day. The following week, on, and feeling cut, just sick that week, on April uh, 26th or 7th or so, right in there on a Wednesday, Seneca Jones did a spray, a ground spray, just about half a mile from us. I could smell it in the air, and within a couple of days after that, I was really wiped out, really sick again, to the point where I, the headache is so excruciating, you can't get out of bed, you, you're having pain in your organs, in your spinal cord, in your kidneys. It takes so much, and, and not only that, it is emotionally debilitating. Once you have gotten to where you got you have headaches and you can't get out of bed and your kidneys are aching. This this then affects your emotions. You then wonder, can I actually carry on? Can I actually continue to raise my animals and my children in this condition? And you start to think, are you going to be able to make it? Are you going to give up? And then what you end up starting to find out is some of these chemicals actually cause suicidal thoughts and depression. I know a woman, I'm not going to say her name, 
But I know a woman who is on antidepressants because of this stuff. And she's been on it for years and she hasn't been able to get off of it. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, for the last month and a half after we just got exposed, I have been trying to get my health back. I'm almost back again, but I can still feel it in my kidneys right now a little bit, just from what I exposed, uh, was exposed to. I know that this stuff is bad for you. I know it's bad for me, and I know it's bad for the animals. So by the way, my dog was sick, my horses were sick, my goats that were kidding during the week that these poisons were going on, a bunch of the kids died. Um, my dog was very sick after this. You could see his eyes were weeping. His nose got a rash on the outside of his nose. And at the time I was sick and feeling horrible, I looked at my dog's eyes and saw the same feeling that I felt in his eyes. He was sick too. Um, I would like to see eventually some of our animals being tested, the milk from our animals being tested. Um, I know for a fact this stuff is bad. And I've been trying to share it with, with people. Now finally that Dr. Dana Barr has come out and said that she's actually found it in us. I didn't need her to do that, trust me. I didn't need that proof. Because I haven't had the proof within my own self. I knew that it was bad for us. But now that we have the proof, maybe, you know, we can get a little further with this. And um, again, I'm here for the truth. And the truth shall set you free. And the truth is good. And the truth will heal us all. And as we heal our planet, we heal ourselves. Um, and I'm just here trying to make the place better, really. I'm just trying to save the planet and trying to save ourselves. I want us to have a good life, and I want our children to have good lives. I want the animals, I want to everybody to have a good life. To be honest with you, these chemicals should be completely banned. I don't know what they could do with them to get rid of them, but they shouldn't be used. We should be loving our planet, every part of it. We should love every fern and everything that grows. Our Mother Earth needs some protection over her body. And when she grows a plant, it's for a reason. The reason why the Scotch broom is growing so prolifically right now is because of all of what Indrasi has done. Indrasi has wiped out all of our native species and put up all these monocrops where now Mother Earth is just trying to cover her body with something that will grow. And it happens to be that Scotch Moon grows in really poor soil. So we have produced some really poor soil all over these hills by all the uh, monocropping, by all the sprays, and by all the fake fertilizers. And now the mother's just trying to do her job. She's trying to, co to cover the planet with something that will heal. And the fact is that Scotch Moon is actually good for the earth. If you look into it, it actually is trying to help. And um, certainly, we don't want to get taken over in Scotch Bird, nobody does. But what we can do is try to put back the native species. Try to understand the native species. Why are they there and what can they offer to us? These monocrops that they're putting up are useless, really. The native forest is where the value is. If you're going to take down a tree that was 400 years old or 600 years old, don't come back for it again in 30 years. Give it a chance. Let's get some 400-year-old trees back again. And how are we going to do that? We have to quit cutting them all down every 30 years. There is a lot of value in the native forest. Tons of value. There is all of the native um, medicines that grow, the mushrooms, all of the, the various foods that we can actually harvest, the berries and things. There's a lot out there. These Franken forests that out here are worthless. Just plain worthless. And um, let's get back what is real. And our native forest is what's real. Our native species. So thank you so much for all of your support. And I know that we can easily fill this room with people who believe like this. 
But they're probably out there trying to run their farm or run their thing right now. They didn't have time to come down here. But I know we have a lot of friends. And I know we have a lot of support. And I just thank you all for being here. But speaking of numbers, I kept track tonight, and um, we were just right up around 90. So we had a very good turnout tonight. Yeah. So I promised that I'd end with an announcement. It's a positive announcement. It is that we got a contact from the governor's office after I did the mailing and the contact was that the governor had read uh, a guest column that I wrote, my most recent one for the Eugene Register, which was about this, and I gave you a copy of it in the mailing. Well, the governor read that, and on certain places I called for the governor to do certain actions, and they actually called me and said the governor had read the piece and agrees with me. Yeah. As far as the good thing, they'll never just change the rules without plenty of science to back them up. So the announcement of the governor is that he has accepted um, our premise that right now the only legal person for investigating anything about pesticides in the state of Oregon has been under the direction of a department in Oregon called the Pesticide Division. <laughs> of the Oregon Department of Agriculture, and in its mission statement, it includes the clause to preserve the availability of pesticides. <laughs> For the seven years that we've been working with the state of Oregon, that's who we've been having to deal with. They are Monsanto, they are DuPont, and they are Dow Chemical, and that's who we've been interfacing with. So what we told the previous governor, and he never even wrote back, but now this current governor actually contacted me back. He agreed that there needed to be an investigation of how 100% of the people on Highway 36 have atrazine and 2,4-D in our pit. Mm -hmm. So he's ordered the Oregon Department of Forestry to provide him with the copies of every spray that has occurred along Highway 36 for the year 2010 and 2011 He's going to have scientists bring up exactly what's been sprayed everywhere, and then he's sending scientists out to check the water, check the soil, and it's the beginning of what they think would be about an eight-year experience divided into two phases. Phase one is fact-finding, and it is that they now consider it, because they checked into Dr. Barr's results, they now consider it beyond debate, regardless of what industry would take, that 100% of us that live out here have atrazine and 2,4-D in our bodies. The government agrees with that. They think it's true. So phase one is to find out how that happened. And so they're sending in scientists from other states who are America's greatest forensic scientists on pesticide and its movement. And they're going to be doing this for several years. And what they're telling industry is that during this phase one, if you will cooperate with us and allow us to be on your land, checking everything about the operations that you do, under the assumption that if we find that it really is affecting the population, that you, as timber guys, wouldn't want that to happen, and that you would agree to changes, or, if you won't cooperate and let us on your land, then we're going to be just off your land doing the same study anyway. <laughs> so, there are also ways to carry it and stick beyond that. So, phase two then, after a several year phase one, there will then be a phase two, which is, okay, having established what the pathways of contamination are, the next question is, how do we close the pathway? We already know that the biggest one is air. 
But they can't change the law without having these kind of scientists come in and do rigorous testing for several years, but now they're sending the scientists and that's my announcement for you. It's late at night, but I want to put in one last pitch. For, see that box on the end of the table? All the money that goes into there, Pitchfork Rebellion has never accepted a nickel of donations at events, so don't expect us to accept that. But anything that goes into that box is going to be for new lockers for the kids at this school. Any of you who have ever seen the old lockers know that they don't even work and they need to be replaced. There just isn't the money for it. So anything that goes into that box tonight is going to go for new lockers for the kids. Since Mariana had a wealth of information she didn't get to share in her time slot tonight, she's going to be over by the information table. And if you need to ask her a question because the light went on and you know she has a piece of information or can recommend a book or a cleansing for you, please see Mariana at the table as we break up. Do you have any questions? I, I did. You asked me earlier. Yeah. She just came up and spoke to me at our first break when we stretched for five minutes. And it takes one minute. Here's what she told me on the break, and I've never known her. I'm 47 years old. I've lived in this area for about 10 years. A lot of Speak up. I've been in this area for 10 years. A lot of you might know me. I've been in home health and hospice in this area for over 10 years, mercy. So I've been, lived a very healthy life after I've heard everybody's stories. I kind of wonder what's been going on with me. For me to come down with thyroid cancer, it's a very aggressive decline in the last two years. I've had two surgeries, I've had radiation, I've had all the symptoms that you guys talk about. And I kept wondering why, why me? And of course I go to the doctors, and the doctors all tell me all my symptoms are in my head. Until I kept forcing and forcing and forcing. Because I'm a nurse and I know my body and I know myself. I got healthy, did all the cleanses drank all the water. Kept wondering why my urine kept coming out green, you know? Lots of vitamins, yellow, but we have nitrates, which are blue, we have a pulp day bomb, but behind us we have the quarry. My urine was green. Why is my urine green? Why turned out to be yellow? And the green, or the blue, baked the green. Again, I was forcing the doctors to put the list to me. It took me two years to get the meat and listen to me. Came up with the thyroid cancer. But of course, to hear cancer and them to say, well, you've got the good cancer. It's treatable. <laughs> Isn't that so terrible to hear? I hate hearing that when I go to the doctor and say, you've got the good cancer. What cancer? It's good. I'm going to fight this for the rest of my life. You know? And what gets me is that I kept thinking there was something in the area, the only reason why I came here, and I cried when I sat in the audience, and I wasn't going to get up, but I thought, you know what, we all need to stand together, because I've known people have come to this area and leave, and probably don't even know, and get exposed in 10, 20 years down the line, they're going to have some type of cancer. But we would really like to get in touch with those people. We really want to get their story. We want to show that it doesn't leave just because you were the person in the area. Well, they might not even know. I would have never known know unless the letter came, and I and I didn't come to this meeting, but I've been fighting and wondering why would I come down with this type of cancer? So why would I have been so healthy? My family has been so healthy. Then all of a sudden, it's progressive. I have stage four. That's the last stage there is when it was found. Lump in my neck. My deepest condolences, and you know, because I've lived through this myself, breast cancer. But I can tell you with my research is that the chemical companies own the chemical companies, own the pharmaceutical companies. They are making us sick and making, trying to make you providing to make us well. And I'm in your second I've been a researcher too, and I know yes. exactly. So please, if anything, come to me. Be sure, be sure. Sorry, I'm sorry. sorry. Old stomach. I'm not a fat person. I have a tumor. In my stomach, two months ago, I had a gallstone attack. They could they took x-rays, they took uh, uh, images, and they said this tumor is between eight and nine pounds, the tumor itself. It covers every organ, every blood vessel in my body. They can't even do microscopic surgery to get this gallbladder out because they said even microsoft is 
as God would kill me. And so I'm praying to God every day Amen. that He Amen. will let me keep living. And being a testimony that these things are affecting people here. That's right. And we got to stop it. That's right. Right on. Right on. Amen. J.D. Bell for you, folks. J.D. Bell. Yes. Yeah.